Hi, uh, welcome to Brooklyn Park Now. I'm Mike Sable, the interim city manager for the city of Brooklyn Park. In each episode, we try to take you to a new location within the city. And it's my pleasure today to bring you to Avenues for Homeless Youth, a, a new teen homeless shelter that's opening in the city to serve our residents. And with me today is Deb Loon, executive director. Welcome, hey, Deb. Thank you. So tell us, what is the story about and how did we end up in this location? Uh, well, this is a brand new shelter for homeless youth from the northwest suburbs. It's called Brooklyn Avenues and appropriately named, we thought. And we are really, really proud to be partnering with the city of Brooklyn Park in creating this new space. This will be a safe, stable, short-term housing solution for youth who are experiencing homelessness from the northwest suburbs. It's been a journey of a couple of years that the community has been on, and we are really honored to be the nonprofit partner that the city picked to work with them. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, and so tell me a little bit about some of the issues and, and why, did, why is a facility like this necessary, in, in particularly in this community yeah. and in this region? Okay, well, homeless, youth homelessness is a significant issue across the state. People used to think it was just in the, in the cities, and of course it's not. It's suburban, it's rural, and it's urban. And it's been growing, unfortunately. Wilder Research does a study every three years where they literally survey homelessness across the state of Minnesota. And when they did their last survey, they found that youth homelessness had grown by 63% over three years, which is tragic. Um, young people end up homeless for a whole variety of reasons. And the city of Brooklyn Park, working with it, the entire community, frankly, really decided we want to create a safe place so that our young people can, can be safe and can stay home in our community rather than have to go to Minneapolis to find services. So Deb, what is this, this partnership that you talk about? Um, who were some of the key players that helped get it started? And you know, what, who, who, do you get to think, who do we want to thank the most for oh, this? It's, that's a really tough question because there are so many people and so many organizations involved. This, the work started before Avenues got involved and there were leaders within the faith community and the city and civic organizations as well that came together and said we need to do something to create a place for our young people. Um, I think about Reverend Rachel Morey who was with Mosaic United Methodist Church and Reverend Steve Larson with Redeemer Covenant and who chairs the Brooklyn Area Ministerial Association. Reverend Adrian Overbeek uh, from Crossroads Church and a number of other churches um, who came together, sat down with the mayor, Mayor Jeff Lundy, and others from the city and the Brooklyn Park Police Department and folks from the schools and said, what can we do, what do we need to do? And from that, really launched an, a multi-year initiative. They created the youth food shelf and clothing closet. They became very active and supportive in the suburban host home program, which is one of our programs. And then they said, let's do the shelter, it's time. That's great. Well, it is a beautiful facility. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so why don't we take a little tour, if we can, and, and kind of show us about some of the services that you'll offer and see a little bit of uh, what that. we have in the house. Happy to do that. We are just, construction has just finished. We have just moved all the furniture in. Uh, we're having the ribbon cutting today and the community open house tomorrow. And so what we have here is essentially a large home. It's a 5,000 square foot building that was really designed to look like and feel like a home. So we have a nice living room, a dining room that is large enough to seat all 12 youth at a time. Um, and we have a full commercial kitchen because we will be preparing three meals a day, 365 days a year for 12 youth at a time. So say more about those, those 12 youth. Uh, how do they get selected? How do, you, how do they know hmm. to come here? Well, how do they know this is a resource in the community? Um, youth will primarily be referred here by adults that, that are supporting them. Okay. So whether it's a school counselor who's working with a young person who they know is homeless, uh, the police will be an important referral source for us as they're working with young people who they know to be on the streets and not able to go home. Uh, churches, other adults, if a young person is unstably housed and needing a new place, um, then they can, they can come here. Okay. And youth will also self-refer. They will hear about sure. avenues. We run a program in North Minneapolis, which is just like this, only a little bit larger and youth know about our services. It's an amazing kitchen. We're really grateful for the commercial kitchen that we have here. And youth will be welcome to help cook meals. Obviously, we want them to learn life skills. Sure. And so one of those is cooking and nutrition. So youth will be in the kitchen working with staff 
uh, as they prepare meals. And when you say youth, what what are the age ranges of, of the young good, people good that are going to be here? Yeah, if the age range is 16 through 20. Okay. Um, we can't go lower than that and we can't go above that because of our state license. So Deb, there's a lot of activity here on, the, on right. opening day, but yeah. what kind of activity can we expect uh, kind of on a, on a normal on day? On a typical day, yeah. 12 young people getting up in the morning, heading off to school or work, whatever they have going on. We will have staff 24 hours a day on site. So we, this is a fully secure building. We've got security cameras throughout the building and at the two entrances. And one of the important things that staff provides is, is that sense of security and safety as well as just ongoing guidance. These young people need a lot of support and a lot of guidance. So on a typical day, they'll get up, they'll go have their breakfast, they'll go about their business, they might spend some time with their case manager talking about their goals, uh, getting help with their needs. Mm -hmm. They might meet with a nurse or the mental health therapist who will come on site a couple, three times a week. Um, they may use the computer lab. So I'll show you all of these places right now. Terrific, let's go. I mentioned uh, the nurse and the mental health therapist. This, was, this is just a small counseling room so they can have private consultation sessions with those people. It's, it's on a motion. Yep. Uh, we do have a, a computer lab for the youth, so three computer stations that are still being set up. The building is handicapped accessible, does not have an elevator because it's small enough that we didn't need an elevator, but we did pro do have a, a handicapped accessible bedroom and a full bathroom here on the first floor. Full laundry room, young people will do their own laundry, but we're providing all the facilities and all of the, what they need to do their laundry. Okay. This is uh, an example of one of the bedrooms. So the youth get an individual bedroom uh, small, but it's got their bed, their desk, and an armoire. And our goal here was to provide them with the privacy that everybody needs. Sure. And and that's a beautiful thing. At our Minneapolis site, they have shared bedrooms, and so and it's very tight quarters. So this was a wonderful. Uh, positive change that we were able to make because the city decided to build a new building. So when a young person comes in here and they need some services, yep. how long can they expect to stay or, or what, is there something that's normal? Or is, it, is it a week? The, is it a month? The, we anticipate the average that they'll stay will be about three to four months based on our experience at our Minneapolis site. Some will stay a very brief period of time and others will stay probably up to a year, really depending on their needs, their barriers, their challenges. Uh, we, we welcome them to stay as long as they need. We do not want to push them out the door prematurely. Okay. So we're on the second floor, which is the yeah. living quarters of yes. the facility, and there's uh, all of them have individual have names. names. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about uh, the names and the significance well, behind it? Our, our staff and youth at the Minneapolis program went through a room naming process, and they selected uh, so. 12 names that are from a variety of sort of perspectives. So we have Ray Charles, who obviously is a well-known and well-loved uh, performer, entertainer. And we have a number of current and historic civil rights and social justice figures uh, who were meaningful and important to the youth and to the staff. So there are 12 bedrooms, 12 different names. Terrific. So Up here on the second floor, 10 of the 12 bedrooms, the other two are on the first floor. And then we have individual little shower rooms and powder rooms so that the youth aren't having to share bathrooms. Deb, you're taking me into a big closet it's that a is huge that closet. is that is half empty or right. half full. Half depend full, depending on your perspective. So tell me about yeah. what this room is and if somebody is watching at home and wants to get involved, what, what, what could they, they do? do? The, we are grateful for community donations to support our programs. And so everything from personal hygiene supplies uh, pillows, sheets, uh, new socks, underwear, slippers, bathrobes, the, the basic things that we need to supply youth, hangers, um, you name it. Uh, we are not equipped with the space to accept other clothing, so we encourage people to donate that to SEEP or other nonprofits that have clothing closets, but we are interested in the basics of the undergarments and that sort of thing, and obviously personal hygiene supplies, school supplies, 
all of those kinds of things are really critical. And w the more we can get from the community, the less we have to go out and buy. So if someone wanted to, to help out, uh, either do donate some yep. items or volunteer some, some time and effort and energy yep. into this yep. project, how can they get connected to you? Um, first way to start is to go to our website, probably, avenuesforyouth.org. Uh, we do have all kinds of information on the website. They can then connect in with our staff who organizes, trains the volunteers, as well as the donations. Terrific. Yeah. So, Deb, thank you so much for the tour. We're such a proud partner of this, and we're so excited for this project, and really appreciate you and everything you've done. Well, thanks. We're, we're just really proud to be part of this, and thank you. Thank the city. Thank all of the residents of the city and all of the organizations involved. Great. Thanks. And we'll be right back. Brooklyn Park Police Department has been phenomenal. They just kept right at it and kept digging and came up with some answers for me. They don't stay in their squad cars, they get out and they talk to these kids. The Brooklyn Park Police Department has 109 sworn officers and 55 civilian support staff. On our squad car are three words that reflect how we police the city of Brooklyn Park. Service, justice, and courage. We serve the residents of the sixth largest city in the state. Come on, let me show you around. We have two police buildings that are both open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year to serve our community. Our residents can walk into either location and get a variety of services. My patrol officers and I patrol 320 miles of road in the city. Have a nice day. I like working in the city of Brooklyn Park because of the diversity of the community. I always wanted to help people. Brooklyn Park Cop Rock! As detectives, we serve our community by investigating crimes and working with our residents. We also have our Safe Streets Unit, which is comprised of four officers and one sergeant. They work low-level narcotics and violent crimes throughout the community. Our Community Response Unit serve our community by working with the youth in the community. We recognize that youth are our city's future. By building positive relationships, we can mentor and lead our kids to make good choices. We build these relationships in many ways, including fishing, we love fishing, sporting activities, and taking time to sit down and talk with the youth. School resource officers are in all of our junior and senior high schools. We keep the schools safe while engaging the community's youth. To provide the best police service to our very diverse community, our Police Cadet Program prepares future officers who have exceptional diversity skills, knowledge, and community connections. We serve our community while training to become police officers. We're the Park Cops Rock! The patrol division handles over 75,000 calls for service each year. We serve a community that is 49% diverse. We provide our patrol officers with the best technology and equipment available. 23 members are assigned to SWAT. It's divided into two teams, entry and sniper. We train an additional 16 hours a month to be prepared to serve our community. Here at the Brooklyn Park Police Department, we have three police dogs assigned to our patrol division. Each police dog is trained in locating dangerous fleeing suspects, evidence recovery, or narcotics detection. Take. Brooklyn Park is one of the few cities that has its own full-time jail. We're open 365 days a year. We've had a lot of success working with our residents to prevent crime. Crime prevention communicates with residents both through technology and personal interaction. In fact, one of my partners is out conducting a premise survey right now. We serve our residents by offering safety tips for homes and neighborhoods. The Multicultural Advisory Committee serves as a bridge between the police and the immigrant community. It's a chance for the police to learn more about the community it serves and a chance for the community to learn more about the police department. Okay. 
We're here to serve you, but more importantly, we're here to partner with you in making Brooklyn Park an even safer community. Well, I, I would start off by saying that uh, I did most of the presentation myself, so any errors are mine. Anything I got right, the staff will say I had the good sense to listen uh, to them as they gave not kind advice. Um, what I wanted to do first, because I usually forget these things, is I'd like to recognize that our city manager is moving on to the city of Bloomington. Uh, we think, well, it's okay to go second place, but um, <clears throat> but uh, we know that there's many things there uh, that Bloomington offers, and uh, I'm very respectful of the fact that uh, a five-minute commute from home is something that you can't replace. Time with kids, uh, that's something you can't buy. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, our city manager as he departs this month that uh, for his hard work, uh, many of the things that we are doing, the success I'm going to talk about, uh, he has been a driving force. I'd like to ask Jamie if he could please stand and just be recognized. <laughs> Notice I didn't give him the mic, so. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> so I, I think the first thing we've done is a, a bit of a rebranding. And I like to say this first, the logo is free. Uh, because KSTP, after their first hatchet job on our rebranding, I've been very careful because they'd love to talk about spending money on a new logo. Uh, what we did as a city is decided that what we were being portraying ourselves as we were not you know your brand is yours if you don't manage it other people will and so we took a process to engage with our residents inside our community people outside and we uh, partnered up with Spawn who is a top flight marketing company uh, irreplaceable knowledge of the market and went out and they interviewed lots of people and kind of got some feedback what do people really think not just electeds, not just the staff, but residents, business owners, people outside the community, people looking to come inside, and really try to take a look at how do we brand ourselves. And uh, the phrasing, uh, unique, united, undiscovered, that is our brand. Uh, we wanted a brand that was built on uh, facts and aspirations, uh, not in illusions and misdirection. In other words, we're not going to say we're not something, and we're not. And that was very much what the community wanted to do. Uh, and so as we're going to start to roll this out, you'll start to see other ways that we may, where does our branding appear? We're working on that right now. Um, I wish we had left the water tower up here because it's in the backyard of the city councilor who just hated that. But uh, there's many ways to brand that. And so you're gonna hear more. And I, you know, tonight's just the first step, but you will start to see this become part of how we identify ourselves um, and keep that idea that, so people will see the symbols um, and start to recognize the city. Uh, economic development, um, I think that, uh, you know, I like to get into the B words, the billion words, so I was really reaching, you know, so once I could get to a half, that was close enough. Um, and so, you know, we talk about investment in our city uh, by private people deciding that our city is the right place to be. And so we're very appreciative of that decision. That comes with hard work by the staff. Uh, it comes with people who, in our community, who've, you know, been talking us up. And I think that, uh, you know, the residents of Brooklyn Park have been very forthright in wanting to be better and help put some economic tools in our pockets that we could use. And so for them, we have to also uh, thank. Uh, we have a number of businesses that will be open up. I think I just tell people just drive down 610, uh, take a left 169 and go down 81 and you will see a lot of economic activity. Uh, you will see buildings going up. You'll see buildings that don't have names on because there's a lot of spec buildings. And that's probably our favorite type of building because that's confidence by other people in what's going on in our city. They don't have a tenant. They're putting up an empty building based on the idea that they believe in our city enough that they're gonna spend millions of dollars and hope that someone's gonna come here. So we know that's important when people do that and we appreciate that. And that's it for today, no. Um, <clears throat> All right, again, there we go. And you know, I want to stress, 610 is great, right? It, lots of activity there, you can drive, you can see it. I, I don't need to tell people, I just say drive it. But it's happening in other parts of the city. Uh, we have three investment buildings on Highway 81. Uh, we have buildings in the south part. We have CarMax that will be coming online uh, this summer, providing jobs, a partnership with Hennepin Technical College. And so it's not just 
the new shiny 610 and that open land, but people are looking elsewhere in the city to be because I think they believe that where things are happening here. Uh, I would like to mention our partnership with North Hennepin, uh, Hennepin Technical College and Rasmussen. Uh, you know, if there's anybody here, if you'd raise your hands, I know there's a couple. Uh, it, just the idea that we've had so many conversations with businesses when we're in these national fights for businesses to decide if they're going to move here. They ask, what is the opportunities for our, us to train employees, retrain, uh, where are we going to get our future workers? Because, and it's important that we have our education uh, facilities there, right with it. And they've been in meetings with our perspective, uh, telling them that they can do things. Uh, Baxter is a great example of that, that they specifically required. We had to provide them with a plan of how could their workers be trained. And we couldn't do it without the colleges. And uh, so I just want to thank them. They are an economic development tool uh, of our city. Um, and I think you're sitting in one, the golf course, right? That for many years has been kind of a jewel and frankly the luster kind of came off, the ring hadn't been cleaned for a while. Uh, we invested, I believe, uh, near $2 million in the golf course uh, to do many things that need to be done. Re that's just what's happening out in the, the greens, the fairways. Uh, and so we think that is part of it. We're not done, we've got some more work to do. We're gonna revamp about how we things, we look forward to working with Lancer on some of those plans. But we look at that as a tool to drive development. We looked at as a symbol of what people might come for. And so there's more things happening. Transportation, I have, I have a feeling this year you're gonna hear the words Brooklyn Park and LRT often in the news. It's not always gonna be calm. It's not always gonna be nice, easy conversations, but there will be conversations, there'll be arguments, there'll be all kinds of stuff, but we're gonna have those discussions. Uh, so this year we've had 10 years of plans by the city to say that we want LRT to come through Brooklyn Park. And so this is the year where the rubber meets the road and some of those decisions about homes, where people's homes need to be acquired, really get to be personal and those things, the decisions are going to be revisited and we're going to have that discussion. And I would challenge everybody in this room who believes that uh, light rail has been a future plan for not just us but for Osseo, Maple Grove, Brooklyn Center, it's a development tool for the Northwest that you stand up and speak your mind. Because I know that we will have a good decision if the maximum amount of people step up, let us know what can this do for us. And there'll be lots of facts you know, that we know about that cities who get light rail versus those that don't, um, the economic, you know, over time, the valuations of their cities. You know, Mayor Wilson talked about how their value is up. As mayors, that's all, that's the biggest thing we care about is the values of our properties going up because that is vitality, that sets a good tax base and that sets us up for the future. Also, I, I have a feeling that uh, Mayor Stephenson is gonna talk about some little road called 610, so I'll leave that one uh, for him. Um, we did open up a, a park ride and we're gonna look at the other one with uh, the light rail. Uh, I think one thing that, you know, I talked about the development, you know, we have a proposal that'll be back up in a month for a $80 million apartment building. The rents are more than mortgages. It is not your normal apartment building. And the reason the developer is looking at building it is because it sits at the end of the light rail. If that light rail wasn't there, the builder simply wouldn't be there. And so when people talk about why do people make investment decisions in communities, things like these can drive those decisions. We also know there are other people looking at similar. And I'll tell a simple story that I use to demonstrate why, why is uh, starting off with a good luxury apartment building the key. If you drive down the road and you see a kid selling oranges, he sets it for two bucks. What do you think the next kid who opens up the stand is going to set his prices at? Maybe $1.95, maybe $2.05 because he's got better oranges, but it's still two bucks. So if we set that bar high in 610, we get apartments that are a little better. Uh, we think the ones that will follow have got a bar to meet, and we think that that means that uh, the city's got to look at investing uh, city investment dollars into that. So we're going to have that discussion at the county level. I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Wil uh, Wilson for saving me some time talking about the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance. So I would like to have uh, the executive director, the mama bear, uh, Rebecca Gilgan, please stand up. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yep. Um, hey, she had, was instrumental in getting that grant. I, I, you, know, you talk about what people do, and I think everybody on the board, uh, advisory board, knows that Rebecca really led the charge. Um, 
This will be the last time you see the word juvenile crime on the same slide as youth development. Because in our city, we now know that we've, we've started to provide safety, we provide ways for kids who don't maybe have some risky family situations that they can get involved with something that gives them an opportunity. Now we need to make that link with, okay, now you've said I'm gonna to commit to education, I'm gonna to commit to maybe doing good choices. How do I get a job? And so I, I, the gentleman from Citrulink, wherever you sat down, I would love for you to talk to Rebecca who just stood up because we are looking for ways for kids to even for eight to 10 hours shadow. You know, a 16 year old has no idea what a job is like. And for them to just shadow for a few hours to understand, hey, there's some, I could do this. I mean, I've got some, I've got to go to school, I've got to, I've got to do some things. But just that idea that there's something waiting for them provides them with hope. And so that's what we're hoping to do is not provide full-time or part-time jobs, but just introduce a kid who maybe doesn't see that in his family or his uh, neighbors, the, the idea that he has value in that. Uh, so I, I would love for that because I, any other business owner who wants to just say, hey, for a few hours, let a kid see what someone does. And, you know, those kind of things is what we're looking for as partners in our community. Uh, the idea that kids, you keep them in school, they don't see jobs at the end of that, they don't really care. You know, uh, hope is not just about safety, it has to be about something in the future that they're gonna work for. And so we've taken that tact on. So like I said, this is the last time we're gonna talk about crime and juveniles. Because we've, we've done that, we know we have more work to do, but now we need to talk about hope, and that's gonna happen with the work of Rebecca, hopefully some partners in the community who wanna at least say, hey, let's give a kid a chance to at least see what work is like. And maybe you might meet one of your future employees that you wanna hire someday. I think this one has been kind of our favorite, my favorite. Um, you know, in about three weeks, four weeks, we'll be opening up the teen homeless shelter. Um, and if anybody wants to understand why is a few weeks of delay mean a lot in the summer? What was the weather like a month ago versus what it's like right now? Uh, you know, one month means a lot. And when you're talking about giving kids 10 to 12 beds to sleep at safely at night in a warm spot, I think we all can understand as we run out to our cars and hope that they start and the heater gets going that what does that simple thing mean? And so that'll be opening up and I wanna thank everyone because frankly, it wasn't a city initiative. The city's Brooklyn Center, Osseo Churches and Maple Grove and Osseo <laughs> stepped up to the plate. Uh, Brooklyn Center was a partner, New Hope was a partner. Uh, the county, I, I can't think of anybody who wasn't involved. I think every church in the city of Brooklyn Park was engaged about raising money uh, committed now to not just to the first year but all the other years uh, because uh, it's important uh, the school district you know plays a role with identifying those kids we know that those kids are gonna be found in schools during the day because it's warm it's safe they get fed there and so that's the place that we need to capture them and get those into a safe spot lastly I'll just mention these last two things which is that we did uh, went through a process of naming our neighborhoods uh, you will see more about that. We're just kind of developing that idea of identity, getting people an idea that where they live is important. Uh, we've seen some great designs I have on how we can take our new branding and apply that. Uh, the other one is uh, Cities United, which you'll see probably in about three months. Uh, Brooklyn Park is proud to be one of the initial 20 cities to be involved with that, but that's the idea that uh, you know, violence tends to uh, really affect uh, youth of color, males, uh, who tend to not see any examples of how they could be in life. And so they tend to get involved with negative activities. And so we're gonna try to see what we can do as a city to identify small steps that we can do. This is a national effort. Uh, Brooklyn Park is helping to lead that by taking part, uh, working with the White House every other Friday. We report in what we're doing to them. And so they're kind of keeping track. But you'll start to hear more about that as we go forward. I think that's it. Thanks for watching another episode of Brooklyn Park Now. Look for us in April for another new episode and another great location in the city of Brooklyn Park.